Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Um, I will talk about the Cambridge Analytica case, maybe from a slightly different angle that you are used to, or at least include some things that are may not be obvious. Um, and the reason for this because is, is because I have been doing research with regard to privacy of third-party apps um, since 2011. So I'm not new to the um, the workings of uh, of such things. And just a couple of words about uh, who I am and where I'm coming from. So I'm coming from Budapest. I work in the crisis lab. You might have heard about the lab. It's a research lab at the University uh, of Technology and Economics here. You might know some of the guys, for example, Laventa or, or Boldy uh, from research on malware or security education. And uh, I'm the new guy. You don't know me. It's OK. Uh, some interesting things about the crisis lab. We have 20% of uh, female employees which is probably a high number. But we also have uh, an even higher percentage of gergays or gergers in the lab. We are 10 people, three gergers. That's very good. OK. So I would just like to walk you through the Cambridge Analytica case. Uh, I will not spend much time on the details that everyone knows, I assume. Just, uh, just to get the whole picture. So, um, the March uh, 2008, so, so this year, um, Chris Wiley, who formerly worked, worked for Cambridge Analytica, blew the whistle, famously, on uh, what, um, what his uh, company was doing uh, um, during and before some uh, political elections and how they did it. And uh, this kind of created uh, quite big waves, I would say. And uh, the details are the following. So there were uh, approximately 270,000 uh, paid users uh, for a psychological questionnaire that was posed on Amazon Mechanical Turk, a crowd, uh, crowdsourcing platform where you could actually pay uh, users to undertake small tasks. They typically pay like one, two, three dollars for a task. And it was also required that these uh, users will uh, have to link their Facebook account to their answers. So essentially they provided also their, um, their uh, Facebook uh, attributes, Facebook profiles. Uh, and they did it through a Facebook app that uh, Alexander Kogan or his company has developed. And so the users for, from Amazon Mechanical Turk, they had to also download and install this Facebook app and uh, grant the permissions that this Facebook app was asking for. Now, through a mechanism that was built in the Facebook API, uh, this app has also uh, got access to the friends of these users, okay, the, the attributes of the friends of these users, and the number of friends for these 270,000 users were 30 million. That's a slightly bigger number. Uh, or 50 million, according to some reports, or 87 million, according to some other reports. Um, and now you can see that um, this data was collected by Alexander Kogan and his company is called uh, Global Science Research. And this was done within a commercial deal with um, SCL Elections, who actually launched Cambridge Analytica, a separate company. But Cambridge Analytica was the kind of like the end user for this data. Then, and then they used it for political marketing that I will talk about later. Allegedly, this data was used to influence voters in the following elections. U.S. presidential elections 2016, yeah, the Trump one. The Brexit vote, yeah, the one that ended up with an exit decision. The Kenyan elections, and elections in an undisclosed Eastern European country. That's the, more, the most interesting for me. It's not Hungary, unfortunately, so I cannot give you more details on this. 
Uh, some of these are alleged, some of these really happened. We have uh, objective uh, data on it. Now what followed, of course, were investigations and lawsuits, both against Cambridge Analytica, against Facebook, or by Facebook, against, for example, The Guardian, who broke the story. But this is all expected, right? One thing is for sure. So Global Science Research, Alexander Kogan's company, when they harvested the data and transferred it to a separate entity, they broke Facebook's terms of service. So there they committed something that is uh, unlawful. But what I'm more interested in is how much Facebook could have influenced um, this kind of data harvest. What was in their power that they didn't know or they hadn't done, but they have done by now. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so I told you about this has created kind of like big waves. So big that uh, Mark Zuckerberg was um, asked to um, be at a congressional hearing in the US Congress, was also appeared in front of uh, the European, uh, not sure about the correct expression, but in front of the European court, okay? And uh, when I saw uh, his interview, the first thing that came into my mind was this. Is it familiar for you? This picture? Who knows the picture? Hands up, please. Okay, so this is Al Pacino in the, the role of Don Corleone in uh, The Godfather. Maybe part two, if I'm correct. At a congressional hearing. So this, this kind of demonstrates that the congressional hearing is something serious. You ju don't just, you know, just uh, cite people to a congressional hearing because they, I don't know, stole a chocolate bar or something. Anyway, um, I promised you a unique take on, uh, on this Cambridge Analytica case. And I have a unique take because of the following timeline. So in 2011, Federal Trade Commission, FTC, who is responsible for privacy stuff in the US, um, they conducted an investigation about third-party Facebook apps and how and how they collect data, um, how their data collection practices are kind of misleading. But Facebook agreed to this and agreed that in every two years they will, uh, they will undergo some kind of privacy screening, every two years once. Now, because of this, I started uh, doing research, uh, academic research, on uh, Facebook apps and privacy. And in 2013, in a paper that's called Interdependent Privacy, Let Me Share Your Data, where actually the term interdependent privacy was first written. Um, I presented it Financial Crypto. It was so long ago that the t-shirt looked like this, okay? Very outdated design, just like Facebook API version 1.0. And, um, and there we used a, a small data set of apps with uh, all the permissions and all the users they had, so we could actually show that this kind of data collection was ongoing by 2013. Actually, 2012, because the work was done in 2012. Now, 2013 and 14, Kogan's app was operational, and uh, data collection was already underway for the Cambridge Analytica stuff. Then, 2014, Facebook got wind of what's going on, investigated these apps, data collection practices, and revised the API. That's when they introduced API version 2.0. And they thought they were done. Okay. And then, uh, at, at that time, I didn't know about this, to tell you the truth. But I was doing some subsequent research on collateral damage of Facebook apps, which is, which is essentially the same thing, uh, how your friends could affect your privacy by installing apps that are taking your data without your knowledge. And this, uh, this was published in 2016, and then the Trump elections came. Nothing happened except for Trump winning. And then 2018, March of 2018, Chris Wiley blew the whistle. Okay, and almost exactly at the same time, our paper 
uh, about comprehensive study of collateral damage on Facebook apps have appeared, okay? Pure coincidence, it has nothing to do with it. So that's uh, why I think I, I have um, a view on, on aspects that most people don't have in this case. And I also present a unique take because um, I'm a wide thinking person. I'm pretty much not suited for deep thoughts. For that I use students, sorry to put it this way. But, uh, but I know that I can think in a big picture. So, so this case is about economics, it's about psychology, psychometrics. This is about uh, technical security stuff like permissions and access control. Um, this is a little bit also about legal things uh, involved. Politics are not involved in this talk, except for uh, saying that, that Mark Z is kind of very political always when, when he's talking about this, uh, this issue. Okay, so let's get rid of the economics first, okay? Most of you probably hate economics. Hands up, who hates economics? Yeah, okay, maybe your economics, but uh, not in general, but it's, it's okay. So, um, from the theory of economics, um, the key um, term that is used here is an externality, okay? Probably most of you heard about it. Uh, externality is a cost or benefit, I'm reading that now from a textbook, that affects a party who did not choose to incur that cost or benefit, essentially a side effect, okay? So when you think of um, externalities uh, and negative externalities, you could think of pollution, for example, that's the textbook example. So you, you have a house somewhere and suddenly the next block someone builds a you know, uh, waste burning, uh, you know, dump or, or a factory, and suddenly you get polluted air, polluted water, and you did not choose that factory to be built there. So you have kind of like a not very much beneficial side effect from that factory. But also, for example, congestion, both in terms of traffic or in terms of uh, you now uh, pushing the button, or not the button, but the screen of your smartphone and trying to get decent Wi-Fi. Uh, download rates, because half of you are doing this, you get congestion. You did not choose the other guy to also browse the internet, but you still experience the effect. And, but there are also positive externalities, for example, the so-called network effects, or, for example, having uh, um, in your neighborhood, if you have a neighborhood watch, which you are not a member of, you will still benefit from the neighborhood watch patrolling the streets and you know, not letting people rob and steal and stuff. But uh, in our case, we talk about a negative externality, which is privacy loss, right? You, you, as a friend of someone, installing Kogan's app, you are not notified, uh, you are not asked to, to give your consent. So basically, um, you are depending on your friend's decision, right? and Facebook's mechanism of uh, uh, permissions. So this is called interdependent privacy. You depend on your friend's actions with regard to privacy. So in the economic literature, how do you deal with externalities? Well, you internalize them. Okay, if there is an externality, you internalize them, somehow make them disappear from the system, and then you kind of have like a perfect market. So what are the, the concepts that you can use. For example, tax, right? Environmental taxes, probably everyone knows them. Uh, CO2 um, taxes or uh, pollution taxes, proposed by a quite a genius guy called Pigu, uh, an economist. So whoever causes the negative externality, they kind of reimburse the society. And then, then it's done. The effect of the externality, you know, vanishes. But who is the one causing the externality here, your friend? Or is it Cambridge Analytica or, or Alexander Kogan or Facebook? So it's kind of like hard to tell in this case, how to use this mechanism. There is of course regulation. So the state can uh, pass laws that are limiting the activity causing this negative externality, that, that's a possibility. And I would say GDPR is along these lines, more or less. 
And then there is something that the economic literature do not really talk about, and that is system design. So if you're des designing the API of Facebook, you could empower users by directly controlling every bit of their information that they put on Facebook. This might not be very practical, but it's certainly possible. <coughs> okay, economics done. Let's go to psychometrics. So, I said that the data harvested by the app then has been passed to Cambridge Analytica and they somehow influence the waters in, the, the waters in uh, political elections, but how did they do that? So first part of this is uh, called psychometric profiling, um, which is, has been developed by uh, Koshinsky, at, uh, Koshinsky and his colleagues at the University of Cambridge. By coincidence, this is the place where Alexander Kogan was working as well. But uh, he was not involved actually in this, uh, in this work explicitly. So what they say that personality can be defined by the big five. You can, you can say there are five metrics on which you score between zero and one. And this combination of five scores, this, this five tuple is kind of unique or if not unique, but it's narrowing down pretty much. And these five are openness. How open are you, are you to new ideas, for example? Uh, conscientiousness, which is a pain to spell, but uh, uh, like how, uh, how much you care about others, basically. Extroversion, how much do you like to present stuff in front of a large audience or how do you want to hide in front of the, the poster and stuff? Agreeableness, which is um, basically kind of like friendliness or cooperativeness. And neuroticism that you could probably understand. So it turns out that such traits can be well predicted by your Facebook likes. I think this is a stunning uh, discovery. And uh, not entirely unexpected, but, but quite stunning. So. So for example, um, if you are not super stable emotionally, then you might listen to music that are performed by, alter, uh, by, by uh, musicians that are not super stable emotionally, like, you know, I'm a bit old, so I would say Nirvana or, or some Gothic rock or something like that. But you could find, uh, you know, present day uh, groups with a certain uh, melancholic, uh, you know, music. Now, that's all fine, but how many likes are needed to predict these, um, these metrics? And it turns out that, to give you an example, uh, from an average of 68 likes per user, it was possible to predict with 95% accuracy the skin color of the given user. Okay. 95% accuracy, accuracy is quite good. Also, with 88% accuracy, their sexual, or, sexual orientation. And to uh, give you an example that is uh, maybe even more uh, featured in uh, elections, 85% uh, um, accuracy, their affiliation to either the Democratic or the Republican Party. Now you can get the idea how this information can be used. <coughs> so, it turns out that around 70 likes, you will know a guy at the level of his good friend, okay? With 150 likes, you will know a certain person at the level of their parents. And if you have 300 likes, then you know the guy as no one else, maybe except for the wife, husband, the girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. And it's also important to see that typical Facebook user uh, has 220 something likes. So between, if you collect all of them, you will know the person somewhere in between the parent and the wife. Okay, it's pretty good. Okay. Now, this is a key point. How would you use this? And the key thing is that it also works in reverse. So you can create psychological profiles, but you can also 
search for people who match some profiles. Okay, so for example, you can search for all angry introverts. Makes sense. Or maybe even all undecided Democrats. That makes sense. Okay. So, so if you can do that, then you can kind of target political ads at those persons. And you show different ads for, um, for example, undecided Democrats, undecided Republicans, because for undecided Democrats, you want, to, want, you want them not to vote. Undecided Republic, if you are Trump, of course, uh, or yeah, whatever. Uh, but, it, but for undecided Republicans, you want to make them go and vote. You show different ads. And th the resolution uh, of targeting is at a very, very fine-grained level. It's called micro-targeting. So let me show you a, an example. So for example, fear advertising is best when you show it to extroverts who are agreeable. Okay, this is like... Uh, this is from the science of marketing. So if you show such a picture uh, and, and the, the text that, well, Hillary Clinton is not a very nice person because uh, he is, uh, she is punishing the poor, okay? Then this would work on undecided Republicans who are extroverts and agreeable to go and vote against Clinton. Or uh, if you know that conscientious individuals uh, are generally more drawn to ads that evoke anger, uh, sorry, anger, then you show them this ad. All those in favor of gun control, raise your hand with a, also a spelling error that might appeal to Republicans, I don't know. But, but okay, so raise your hand and then you show Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama together with Hitler and Stalin. Not a very, you know, promising uh, uh, environment. So this is this is how the influence uh, can be, you know, exerted on on people that you kind of know, you know their uh, psychological profiles. Okay. So psychometrics done. Let's go to technical stuff. So let's talk a little bit about the Facebook API or the Facebook Graph API, as it is called. Uh, I would state that it was designed explicitly for being able to scrape information on users' friends. Because there are permissions, there were permissions to be correct, um, that allow an app to collect the information of a user who does not know that it is collected. Okay? Without the knowledge and consent of that user. This, this is the system design part of the problem. If you uh, recall my slide in economics, this is a way that you, there is a way that you can change the system design, remove the externalities. So if you give the choice to the user and the control to the user and the information to the user, then there is no externality. It's based on his or her decision uh, to let the information be shared or not. So how it is, how it is well, sorry, how it was done uh, in the first version of the API, there, there are, were one permission per profile attribute, which is called friends underscore XXX, friends underscore movies, friends underscore location, friends underscore education. There was also a read mailbox uh, permission for users' friends. Again, this is a system design choice. Why would I let uh, access for a third party app to, to, to access my friends' personal mailbox, right? And, um, and then Facebook claimed that uh, when, when they found out that Kogan's app is doing this kind of uh, large-scale scraping, they changed the API to version 2.0. In 2014, they introduced a single permission, user underscore friends. This is not solving the problem, of course. But they also uh, made it so that information only available on friends they also install the app. Okay, they remove the interdependent aspect because if you install the app, then they already have your data, right? And also mutual consent, consent from both 
uh, users had to be given uh, to, to, the, to grant the user friends permission. And on the side currently is uh, version 3.1. Uh, of the API, okay, with weak permissions and strong app review, which is kind of like uh, the countermeasure against a second Cambridge Analytica case done by Facebook. So right now, this problem is solved. But let's get back to version 2.0. So Facebook claims they solved the problem with 2.0. This is a, a screenshot you might not see it clearly from the back, but this is a screenshot of the Facebook API Explorer, which is like a tool where you can emulate what your app would see, would it be a proper app on Facebook. And what you could see here is that on the left side, there is a user called Foodspot. He has actually one friend that's called Starfish. And on the right side, you see the friend's data from an app's perspective. And you see on the right side, there are several attributes like gender, hometown, languages, location, favorite themes, birthday, which the app can get. So this must be version 1.0, right? Oops, 2.3. Okay, interesting. Now let's see. Uh, the deprecation date of version 2.3, oops, 2017, July. So Facebook claims they solved the problem in 2014 by changing to version 2.0, but in practice, you could still do stuff until 2017, July, so three more years. Uh, we actually asked them, why are we having these results? And, and they actually answered. I, did, I didn't expect an answer, but in three days they answered. They said, all 2.x versions, they behave exactly the same. Probably the other friend also installed the app and they have given mutual consent. Well, this was not the case because we prepared this example, so it was not the case. And also version 2.4, this is removed. You cannot get the data from the friend anymore. So it seems either by conscious choice or by an extremely lax uh, software development process, for three extra years, apps had access to this kind of data. Okay. Uh, there is more to this. Who knows these settings of privacy in Facebook? Hands up. Apps others use. One, two, three, four, four, okay. That's uh, kind of average, I would say. So four out of uh, 100. Now, these um, checkboxes should control whether you, as a friend of a user who installs an app, allow, in general, not per app, but in general, your data to be collected. And if you allow, which kind of data? So. You can see the defaults on the screen. So defaults are you allow everything, of course. It is not privacy by design, it's sharing by design, okay? So, so there is a setting for eliminating interdependent privacy, but users don't know, and the defaults are pro-sharing. Okay, then we started checking and unchecking boxes, and what we have seen was nothing. Okay, we checked the non-check boxes and it had zero effect, except for posts on my timeline because that had an effect so then, then the app couldn't see uh, the friend's posts. And we told this to Facebook and they confirmed, yeah, this uh, settings menu is actually deprecated, but it was there, how long? Ah, sorry, so, yeah, so even the expert of experts could only say, I really can't make sense of it, that was me. Okay, so this was in the user interface until the April of 2018. So API version 2.0 introduced in 2014, 
this settings menu was there until 2018. Four years of nothing, actually. Again, either conscious choice or extreme relaxed software development process. Okay? After that, you can see this screen appearing instead of that settings. It's still there if you go into your Facebook account. I say if you removed apps others use, these are all dated settings and applied to an older version of our platform. And it's still there. I think it's a shame, really. Okay. Now, to be a little bit more scientific, we also quantified the likelihood that this kind of data collection uh, has reached you, and also the impact, how much information it has collected from an average user. And what we see is this. So this is a single app. Imagine a single app, very popular, say TripAdvisor, for example. The probability that this happens to you, so you are a friend of another user who installed this app, is larger than 80%. Okay. So 2 billion Facebook users, 80%, 1.6 billion users affected. This is for a single app. I will get back to this. How significant, significant is this? What is the impact? Well, we've, we have found from a very large data set. It's called App Inspect. It's still online. You can download it and play with it. Um, that there are two profile items on average per user that is taken. Okay. Could be little, could be a lot, you know. This is average, not mean, okay. Then, is this data collection legal under the lens of the new general data protection regulation? Everyone's favorite in this room, of course. Um, and uh, we had some legal experts working with us, and what they have found is that the lack of transparency in collecting this data so you don't know that your data is collected, and uh, the non-existing consent. These are two building blocks of the GDPR. They are not there. So should they continue this um, now, it would be illegal, right? Uh, they also mention that even your friend who installs the app could be liable depending on who has the better lawyer. Because there is a concept called amateur data controller that would apply to your friend, or not, depending on the strength of their lawyers, uh, which would make you also liable if you install an app and your friend's data is taken. Okay, so it's a bit gray. And then we also conducted a survey with users, real, real people, if they care at all. Right, because they say it a lot. I mean, there's a lot of research going into privacy, a lot of people using uh, and sharing, using services and sharing their data, and they don't care about privacy. Yeah, sh yeah, take my data. So what? And what we have found in this particular case, because uh, because of the two-way nature of this, so I can share my friend's data with a third party without her knowing that annoys me. People care about their friends. Also the other way around. I care about my own data not being shared by a random Facebook friend who is not really my friend. I don't want that. So the survey showed that 77% uh, cares at least a lot. There were like a scale of five and at least four. Uh, I was given my 77%. And they mentioned the lack of notification and the lack of consent as the the two things that are missing um, in this case. Okay. <coughs> so what did Facebook do? How do they, how did they react? Now, well, we had the first appearance of uh, Mark Zuckerberg in such a case because of the big waves that were generated. First reply, ah, we are an idealistic company. We never thought that your data could be used like this. Well, I could characterize this answer with a two-letter abbreviation that I will not, not say now, okay? 
uh, some tangible uh, answers is like tightening privacy, <coughs> sorry, tightening privacy controls that they did a bit. So they kind of uh, homogenized the privacy controls inside your settings menu. Then uh, they released the tool, so you could check if you were affected in the Cambridge Analytica case. They, there were mostly U.S. citizens that were affected, but as it turns out, there were 32,000 32, Hungarians also affected. I checked. I was not affected. I didn't vote for Trump. Didn't vote for Hillary either, so it doesn't matter, but still. Um, what they also did is restricting APIs that are connected to Facebook. For example, the Instagram API or the Graph API itself. So version 3 is very strict uh, with regard to friends' data collection. They hired thousands of people to do app review, like real humans, thousands of real humans. It's kind of expensive for them. But they really wanted to show that they care about this thing. Of course they care. They are working or have been working towards being GDPR compliant. Of course, Mark Z has appeared at different congressional hearings. And they said something about paid subscription to Facebook. OK, I haven't seen that happening so far. But uh, one of the high-ranking officials, maybe a vice president, uh, said that there will be two tiers, free service, where you kind of pay with your data. You All of you know that there is no free lunch. So you pay with your data, or you pay with cold hard cash, and Facebook doesn't collect your data. That brings up another very interesting research branch of how people are willing to pay for their privacy. They are not. So, OK. And uh, there are tangible you know, reactions. I commend them for this. Uh, but some privacy issues are still untouched. For example, how you fuse uh, data uh, from multiple apps from the same provider with a global identification, of, a global ID of a user. Okay, this is still not, uh, this is still a bit uncharted territory. And another, um, another thing is that who knows graph search on Facebook? Okay, question, is it still available? Okay, so there's the answer. So there is no user interface for graph search anymore. Graph search was a search engine inside Facebook where you could kind of put together questions in natural language. Uh, like, uh, I would like to know uh, people who are my friends and Catholic and liked the condom brand Urex, for example. Okay, such kind of... You, you feel that privacy is a bit, uh, you know, yeah. So they revoked graph search in 2013, if I recall correctly, but it's still available. You just have to know how to compose the URLs. Okay. So this is still uh, uh, uncharted. Now, is privacy dead? A lot of people, a lot of security and privacy experts, actually, about privacy experts, no, but security experts would say, yes, it's dead. Forget about it. Privacy experts obviously don't say this because then they take away their livelihood. Okay, so I wouldn't say this. Uh, I would say hopefully not because the GDPR, even with all of its, uh, you know, complications and uh, uh, grayness and, uh, you know, um, it's still a step in the right direction with regard to, you know, users' privacy. And then you have, of course, privacy by design principles. You have a real provably private uh, mechanism in differential privacy that you could uh, maybe uh, employ in certain situations. There are different privacy-enhancing technologies, pets. So in general, Privacy may not be dead. On Facebook, though, well, I wouldn't say yes or no, but this is the list of scandals from small to large that is connected with the privacy problems on Facebook. 
2006, 2007, 2011, 13, 14, you see the pattern, right? Almost every year. For example, graph search. For example, uh, mood manipulation done by Facebook scientists live on a, on a live product on Facebook. Uh, how they do user tracking and obviously the Cambridge Analytica stuff. So, for example, watch the news next year. If there is a zero uh, scandals with regard to Facebook and privacy, probably Facebook is bankrupt by then, okay? And this is because Facebook is built on your personal data, okay? So privacy has been, privacy is, and privacy will be always an issue uh, with Facebook. This is the nature of business. It's in their economic incentives to make you share and to use those information for profit. Now, let's see how the scandals had an effect of the share price of Facebook. This is uh, the last year. So you could see a uh, valley in March uh, 2018, right? Where the share price went down to 152 or something like that. And it lasted at least a couple of days and then it went up to an all time high. So much for the effect of privacy on the Facebook shares. Can you guess what happened in July that made the share price drop? by 11%? Sorry? No, that was earlier. No. Q2. Q2 reports. Second quarter of the year, financial reports, reports were not very favorable. Nothing to do with privacy, obviously. And uh, you could see that there is a downward trend now, but if you take the big picture, it looks like this. Okay, that gives you a perspective. Started from $38 per share at the IPO, and now it's uh, like 150 with a huge dip. Okay. And of course, there is a current Facebook scandal. It's not privacy, but it's security. Uh, discovered the end of September, 50 million accounts hacked. But this was done because there existed multiple bugs that could be exploited together uh, from the view as feature of uh, the Facebook client. Um, so this is not intentional. Oh, sorry. So that was a surprise there that I kind of gave away. But uh, so you can see that I'm really, you know, kill, killing Facebook, grilling Facebook with regard to privacy, but to go to the other side, it's very fresh, the ongoing Google Plus uh, controversy, you know, they, they are shutting down Google Plus after a cover-up of a data exposing blog, blog, bug. This is from TechCrunch, this, um, this picture. And this is actually Google's Cambridge Analytica moment. It is exactly the same kind of information leak. So permissions to a third-party app given by a user to access the user's public profile also yields the user's private profile and the friend's private profile. Exactly the same. Only this is because of a bug and not because of a design choice. So there were more than 400 apps doing this, 500,000 profiles taken. The only difference is that no one cares about Google+, Plus, probably. So now they, they also close it down, but this bug was there for three years. Again, yeah, this can happen, but it's not very nice. And also, they patched it in March, but they didn't say so. Guess why? What happened in March? <laughs> good, good, good answer. Cambridge Analytica happened in March, so you don't want to be take away your competitor's downfall, right? So that's why they didn't say so. Okay, to, I'm wrapping it up, if it's okay. Um, yeah, we got a little bit of fame because of our uh, research and uh, Cambridge Analytica case breaking at the same time. So we got uh, interviewed by, you know, French, American, 
uh, news portals, The Atlantic, NBC News, Wired. And um, we also had some lawyers approaching us, that was scary, uh, to act as expert witnesses in forthcoming uh, Facebook uh, uh, lawsuits against Facebook. But fortunately, it went away, so we don't have to deal with that. And at the end, I would like to, to show you my partners in crime. So on the left side, you can see Pern, uh, who I co-authored the interdependent privacy paper from this conference in 2013. He is now working in the privacy team of Google. This is how the word works. And the other guy is Iraklis, who just finished uh, his PhD degree in, in Leuven, in, in Belgium, and now is a postdoc in uh, Luxembourg. Plus, we had more um, co-authors from Belgium, Spain, and Hungary. And uh, the last slide, if you are interested in a little bit more details, you could turn to the Crisis blog, where we have a post on exactly the same thing. And the two research papers, the collateral damage paper that came out in 2018, and the interdependent privacy paper that came out in 2013. Thank you for your attention.